Hey everyone, um, we'll probably have some more people trickle in here, but I'm actually going to start off with this presentation with kind of a little bit of overview about what research is basically and how it works. And I know it's probably going to be uh, very much of a refresher for some of you, but I think it is sort of useful for context. So anyway, I'm Gordon Half. Um, I'm, uh, I work in the emerging technology area at Red Hat. It, it's also ended up kind of spilling over into open source and things like that, partly because I uh, have written a book on open source, the new edition of which uh, came out uh, late last year. And uh, shameless plug, there will be a book signing. Um, I'm not sure how many copies there are, but it's a somewhat limited number. So if you're interested, show up and you will get a signed copy. And if you can't make it, feel free to give me a business card or whatever we use these days. And uh, I, can, I can send you uh, over a digital copy. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, used to be an IT industry analyst, used to be a big system product manager uh, person, and um, you know, have a website there. These slides are already online on the, uh, on the Linux Foundation site, so, um, you can, uh, so you can see them here. Um, now, no, normally I was here hoping to be tag teaming with uh, our senior manager in, on our Brand Insights team, who's actually responsible for a lot of this research ultimately, but uh, she wasn't able to make it, so you'll have to put up with just me. And fundamentally, there's two different types of research. Now, this is a very short introduction to market research. Uh, there's all kinds of other studies you can have, but generally speaking, we have these two categories, quantitative and qualitative. If you look at quantitative research, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about today, you have fairly large samples, at least if they're any good, they're fairly large samples. The, uh, both the surveys I'm going to be ta primarily talking about today are something over a thousand uh, IT decision makers sort of levels. Uh, that's sort of another point about research in general is you do have to pick your audience. I mean, obviously the kind of results we're getting here from worldwide IT decision makers, if we conducted a survey of uh, college students, for example, we would probably get very different results. In fact, we probably wouldn't get very informed results. Uh, because it's quantitative, you can ask the same questions year over year, uh, or whatever the frequency of your survey is, and you can kind of track results and say, oh, things are going in this particular type of direction. Um, it's a structured questionnaire. What that means is, they're typically multiple choice or on a scale from zero to 10 type of questions. Um, we will sometimes do in these surveys that if someone doesn't know or can't answer one question, we'll take them out of the tree for that particular question. So you can kind of probe more deeply in particular areas uh, depending upon how someone has answered previous questions. Uh, it's mostly closed-ended. You can have you know, other choices, fill it in. People generally don't do that very much. Uh, Meable st statistics, and obviously coming up with a structured questionnaire assumes you know something about the problem space. In other words, that you can give multiple choices that are logical things to ask. You know, uh, is Linux secure? Um, here are the re you know, do you believe Linux is secure? And you know you can have a scale, you can have specific multiple choices, but you need to know enough about how someone might think software is secure or not secure to be able to pick out those choices. Now, qualitative is a much more limited sample. Uh, it's not the only type of qualitative research, but what's probably most familiar in the context of what. Uh, for instance, we do a Red Hat with our corporate research or focus groups. 
So I'll, I'll show you a picture later and kind of explain a little bit how that works. Um, you can kind of get directional results, but you don't get numbers. Uh, you generate dynamic discussion. There's a, in a focus group, there's a bunch of people in, in a room. Uh, and they can sort of play off of each other as those kind of things happen. Open-ended can very much deal with emotion as opposed to just raw facts. And it's very useful for exploratory or discovery. For example, one of the focus groups, which I'm not going to talk about here, that we do fairly regularly, is uh, focus groups around language. You know, when we, for instance, describe Red Hat or we describe a uh, a product or a technology this way. Um, does, this, does this language resonate with you? And we've done this, for instance, with digital transformation too. It, you know, does digital transformation speak to you? Or does digital leadership speak to you? And ask kind of questions like that, which obviously have relevant, which then feed into the qualitative surveys because if a particular uh, kind of approach or process or whatever doesn't resonate with IT decision makers, we should probably shouldn't ask in that terms. And I've actually got an interesting example of that here. And just some examples, you know, so many people bought ice cream today at the grocery store. Well, why did you buy ice cream today? And we, you might or might not have been able to pick those results for a, for a multiple choice. Um, net promoter score that probably most of you are familiar with, basically, would you recommend this company? You can come up with a number. You can also ask them, would you recommend this company and why? It's like, well, I wouldn't hesitate to do it because they've done such a great job of supporting me. And again, Maybe you'd pick that as a multiple choice, but maybe you wouldn't. Um, you know, rate this grocery store, okay, it gets four out of five. So why is it four out of five? Well, you know, I kind of like it, but it's not perfect because this isn't as good and this isn't as good as other grocery stores are. So, uh, you know, so it could be better. And that that's arguably the, the right column there you have enough of those is more useful in that case than just a percentage number. And these are just some examples. Um, we do not normally have smileys in our virtual uh, uh, Zoom focus group up there, that, that, but that's from an actual Red Hat focus group and obviously what protect people's, people's um, uh, confidentiality. This is what a typical focus group looks like. If not, any of you have never been in one, you know, basically there's a conference room. You have a facilitator who is typically not from the company. It's, there's companies that specialize in this sort of thing, and then you have a, um, and then you have a. Um, one way or two way mirrors, whatever. You have one of those mirrors that you can look through and you've got basically, you know, some little mini stadium seating on the other side with a bunch of people from, you know, Red Hat in our case there. And you have the facilitator and they'll run out and get, you know, get questioned, you know, hey, can you explore this a little further? And so that's kind of how a focus group works. And then all of you have, I'm sure, seen kind of the more traditional kind of, you know, what industry are you in? You know, what are the things that might affect a purchase for you? Um, and other types of kind of ranking scores. And, you know, in this case, this is, a, you know, asking something about social media companies, I guess. Again, this is probably from an actual survey. So we kind of blocked out what the actual questions are there. But you, you can imagine that kind of thing. So with that very quick introduction to research aside, um, most of the data here, as I say, is going to be quantitative data. Um, primarily drawn from these two reports, which have all been running for a few years now. Um, we're actually just finishing up the global tech outlook for, um, that was out in the field, I think it was last July and August. Uh, so in fact, I'm getting 
pinging uh, emails right now. When can you get work the revisions to that report? So that, that's going to be out um, later this fall. State of Enterprise open source. The data has been collected, but is still in the process of being um, being worked on. That's something else I need to do when I get home. Uh, but these are the two primary sources of data here. Um, this is actually from the prior year of Enterprise open source. So um, this is a good, this is a you know, sort of what you'd expect, but it's a nice confirmation. Uh, Enterprise open source among, again, IT decision makers, mostly at uh, at least medium enterprise companies, um, are essentially they're saying that Enterprise open source has passed proprietary usage and that they're obviously in very different trajectories. Um, one thing I'll note here is uh, community supported open source um, is also up, although it hasn't been growing quite as quickly as enterprise open source has. And by the way, if anybody along one of these slides says, wait, can you explain that? We don't have a huge group here, so we can certainly do that. The, another question we ask every year is what are the top ways that enterprise open source is being used? And I, most of the questions of this type in the EOS report uh, are often you know, in the form of you know, what are your top three uses or what are your top three priorities? And in this case, IT infrastructure modernization was in the lead and that's been a fairly consistent pattern uh, year over year. Now, what I think is interesting about that, though, is that I think if you asked that question, you know, five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, what they would have meant by that answer was probably something like replacing Solaris with Linux, replacing, sorry, Arno, AIX with Linux, um, you know, replacing, uh, um, you know, replacing some, you know, like Oracle App Server, uh, WebSphere with, uh, with JBoss, for example. But particularly if you look at some of the other data in the, uh, in the surveys here, I think there's probably a good case to be made that a lot of this infrastructure modernization is container platforms and Kubernetes and uh, sort of, modernizing, but mo modernizing like with like, but rather modernizing traditional legacy, whatever you want to call it, with containerized environments. And what I think is also then interesting here is that fairly shortly afterwards comes in application development, digital transformation. In other words, this isn't about using enterprise open source because it saves money, because it's cheaper. Um, it's to do these things that are really about innovation in enterprises and other organizations. Now, we asked pretty much all these surveys are across geographies. Frankly, and I, I think this is often the most interesting result around geographies, is that there's less difference than you might expect. Most of the answers here are um, fairly universal in roughly the same numbers. Now, if you actually read that, you'll see some of the you know, answers are a bit different. But really, I'd probably argue that DevOps, digital transformation, application modernization, application development are all kind of it's almost a language thing. I mean, those things are all very much connected with each other because you're not going to digitally transform, for example, if you don't do any new applications. Um, I'd probably be talking more about this if we were at KubeCon, but we, we have asked quite a few questions that relate to uh, Kubernetes and containers, and I have a couple of pieces of data here. So first of all, I mean, just kind of an overall thing, you know, depending on what your criteria is, whether it's 
just extremely important or extremely important plus very important or just merely important, clearly Kubernetes is very important to cloud native application strategies. And this is actually an area where you do see some geographical uh, differences. And these are, the, these are the type of geographical differences that historically were pretty common in surveys. I think they've argu arguably, the differences have shrunk a bit, but yeah, you know, the U.S. Is kind of, tends to be first in terms of adopting new technologies. And I think there, again, is a more complicated story in general these days because there's obviously some technologies um, like perhaps blockchain, for example, that actually do see more rapid adoption in uh, APAC, for example, for various reasons. But usually the U.S. is leading there for new technology adoption. EMEA usually follows it. APAC is a bit further again. Uh, and uh, LATAM tends to take up the tail. And, I will say that for LATAM data, I know this was true for the global outlook trends this year, it's not every country in uh, Latin America. They, they tend to be dominated by Brazil and Mexico uh, where we ask the questions. Um, this is phases of container adoption and here we've also, you, you, here you see some differences between industries. And again, I think this is, particularly at the top, this is fairly common. Certainly Linux came in with financial services and you know, that was really the big driver with the aforementioned Solaris to Linux uh, takeout in, in financial services. And financial services, you know, lots of money, lots of in-house development. They're you know, kind of out there and leading in um, in um, container adopts as well. And telecommunications is about in the same boat, getting lots of money being spent in 5G build out and edge computing architectures and the like. So not terribly surprising. Um, healthcare is somewhere in the middle. It, it's down near the bomb here, you know, I, I think if you want to make up kind of stories or narratives about this, it's like, well, healthcare has had a lot on their minds as an industry this year. And, and you know, maybe in general, you know, some hospital IT projects haven't necessarily been going ahead full speed. And then retail, I think is probably kind of a mix. Retail is a situation where there's obviously the Walmarts and the Amazons and so forth of the world where there's actually quite a bit of technology innovation going on. And then you have a large tail of smaller retail that is, they, you know, is leveraging some of the, um, you know, like credit card technologies out there and the like, but it's probably not really leading edge. Um, now let's talk about benefits of using open source. And if I'd asked this question 10 years ago, what does someone here think would probably have been the leading reason? Cost, uh, exactly. And cost, by the way, is still on this list. It's, I think it's down, was down at number six because, you know, I don't care about how much it costs, said no CIO ever. Um, but I think it's nonetheless notable that if you look at you know, but first of all, reason for the ability to safely leverage, that's sort of the, the value, you know, one of the value propositions of enterprise open source. So that's unexpected. But, you know, can you, again, can you imagine how many people 10 years ago would have said enterprise open source gives better security? There might be some argument over, well, well, I don't think open source is any worse, but these are people saying it's better. And then, the, you know, kind of the top two is, is about better software. It's not about cheaper software. It's about better software. And I think that tells a really kind of nice story about enterprise open source. Um, 
you know, and really open source more broadly, this idea of getting access to the latest innovations while also being able to safely use them in an enterprise. And finally, you know, one particular kind of roll up here was 84% say the enterprise open source is a key part of their organization security strategy. And again, geographically, this is you know, pretty much flat across the board, you know, across the world. Now, let's talk about security. Um, but I will talk about security. <laughs> but, uh, first of all, you know, so we also asked, I've been really talking about kind of technology uh, adoption and priorities so far, but how about the top funding priorities outside of IT uh, technology? And um, this is pretty consistent with what we, we've seen, uh, we saw in the, uh, this, this survey, the Global Trends survey this year. And digital transformation led. The other thing that, um, and this was, I think what these numbers were even up this year uh, in terms of kind of the training and uh, you know, both technical skills and people process skills and developer hiring and retention. The, you know, there's a lot of, pe you know, there's kind of a lot of people there. Now, technology is specifically excluded from here, but um, you know, I think it, I think it is interesting that you know essentially people plays so far uh, so far up there. Now I think it's always reasonable to ask. Yes. Um, yes, and I will actually and I, let, let let me uh, let me hold that for another slide because that is very observant. Um, it, um, yeah, so just to make final point there, one of the, uh, it is reasonable to ask, um, and this, by the way, also applies to like security funding priorities and so forth also, but okay, as a funding priority, how much did you actually spend? You know, is, is this one of those aspirational things or is this something that you're really making investments in? Uh, can't tell from this data. I think it is a reasonable question to ask with those kind of things though. Um, you also mentioned security. I mean, compliance is sort of middle of the road there. Um, and again, this is, you know, the, uh, you, you know, I don't think in this question, I don't think we broke down specifically w what areas the training was in. That might be an interesting thing to follow up on. Um, and in general, though, what we see, and unfortunately we didn't re-ask this the following year, but you look at uh, you know, sort of in digital transformation, you know, where does the money go? And it's still sort of oriented towards new technologies as opposed to processor people. I mean, this isn't bad. Uh, you know, it's not like we're seeing 80, 30, 30 or anything like that. But certainly there still does seem to be this emphasis in technology. And that's kind of been historically what anecdotally people say is true. Now, I will say as we go through some of these surveys, like the training, uh, like the, tr the training in the previous slide, it feels like there's more of a, sh somewhat of a shift going on. And certainly I listened to a bunch of CIO panels over the last 18 months or so, and you know, the, CI you know, the CIOs were in those panels were really Focus, very much focused on the people component of things, as well as some process. I'll also mention, and I'm not sure to what degree I believe this result, but we're, I was talking with our um, manager of research a few days ago about, and we're running a, um, basically a, a trial of a, of a new, a new uh, survey vendor who basically does sort of short 
focused surveys to let us get something out in the field in a hurry. And they found in a question that they asked that it was people over process over technology and quite decisively. Now, as I say, new vendor, we haven't proven them out yet. It would need some more research, but there are some encouraging directional signs, at least encouraging from my perspective, that are emphasizing kind of the people aspect of digital transformation, other types of projects. Um, IT funding priorities. Well, security is way up there. Um, again, the same caveat of, yes, it's a priority. Are you actually going to do something about it is, again, a reasonable question to ask. And management is up there. Um, I, in this particular survey, IT automation is a little further down. We've done a fair number of other studies that seem to show more of an emphasis on IT automation these days. So I, I think it may have gone up a little bit too uh, in this year's uh, data. One thing I find interesting, and it was this was sort of data from this year is similar, is that for all the talk about AIML, and AIML is a big part of the kind of data analytics related uh, funding when we kind of drill down into emerging tech, but that's fairly near the bottom. Um, and so overall, there's, there, there maybe isn't as much funding going into uh, data analytics and so forth, that at least a lot of companies, there's obviously companies that spend an enormous amount there, but uh, others who, who don't. And I did, was, did hear from an analyst maybe a couple weeks ago who was going through some of their own survey work, and they were sort of saying that they've seen, over the last year or two, they've seen storage and related analytics as kind of being a sort of a stay the course type of thing, as opposed to something people were necessarily uh, committing significant new funding to. And I think we could come up with a lot of theories about this. Uh, I, I think it is true that there have been, a lot of companies have found challenges in terms of getting useful you know, business results out of some of their analytics. So maybe there's some of that going on. Now, how, what are the funding priorities within security? Okay, network security, that's kind of the traditional bread and butter security stuff, so sure. Cloud security, um, you know, data protection, uh, threat intelligence. This is all about what you ex you'd expect. However, and by the way, the, what I'm about to talk to was matched perfectly with this year's survey. What should be at the bottom, way at the bottom, but third party or supply chain risk management. What we've been hearing about at great length in various keynotes and so forth this morning, uh, that would be third party or supply chain risk management. How yeah. Is this survey compared to like what Biden's executive order came out? Was this this will have been done, but what, that, that, when did that come out? That, uh, this was this was out after this was in the well this year this year not not this one but this year's yeah that was out in like July and August okay. so it's after some very high profile attacks it's after Biden's executive order I'm a little bit like what the hell is going on here so uh, and homework assignment here is. You know, I'd, I'd be interested in people's thoughts about why this result is here. I mean, you can come up with a number of hypotheses. Uh, one is people don't read uh, or something. Um, I think, you know, I think it's also possible that some, Bo, but we don't use open source in our app development, so why would that be a problem? Uh, you're using open source in your application development. You're using a lot of open source in your application development. Yeah, I mean, with all the security risks and, and all the point solutions, is there some sort of a trend for consolidation? 
Yeah, yeah. Let, let me talk. That. Let me just finish in this thought, and then let me get to that one because I think it's a good point. Uh, you know, does supply chain risk management just don't they connect there? Is it something that they think their, you know, their vendor is taking care of them? I mean, you know, frankly, I think it, you know if you you obviously need to be aware of patching and everything, but you know, if you're talking about buying, say, Linux from an enterprise open source fair, yes, they're actually taking care of most of that problem for you, but you probably have your own applications as well. Um, what was the question? <laughs> Um, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, so the question really sort of relates to there's all these point solutions, um, and I think there's a couple answers to that. First of all, you do see vendors like Synopsys, for example, who are trying to, you know, do a broader picture thing, uh, and I think that's good. And I, you know. I think that kind of stuff has gotten better and will continue to get better. On the other hand, if I'm being totally honest here, there in a, in a you know, DevSecOps pipeline, there, depending upon your use cases, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, there's kind of a lot of different ways that things can be done. Uh, you also have a lot of innovation happening in the CNCF, for example, and you know you don't necessarily want to say we just want one overarching thing. Um, Stephen O'Grady, who I used to work with, uh, who's at who's at Red Monk, um, actually came wrote a piece recently about kind of integration versus best of breed, and um, and I think that's actually very relevant for a discussion around security products, for example, because you know there's something to be said for integration, there's something to be said for best of breed, you know, whether open source or something else. Um, what are the top barriers? Um, so last year, this is last year's um, uh, report, integration issues was number one. That was down a bit in this year's report. It was no longer, no longer number one. So, I mean, the differences here are small, and I think you can probably overinterpret, you know, a two or three percent delta. Um, security and compliance is. Um, you know, is, is high up there, unsurprising. You know, talent gaps, I'm sure that, I forget what the result was this year, but it's certainly not going to be any lower than it was last year. Um, and, uh, you know, you hear that just about everywhere, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, sort of, sort of what you, sort of what you expect, technical debt is up there. Again, I don't think that's really terribly surprising to anyone. Um, in terms of emerging technology, and again, this was um, um, the, the results this year were pretty consistent. Um, depending upon how you count, either AIML is the lead among emerging techs, or we, we kept these as separate questions: edge or fog computing and internet of things, and. We could have a discussion about kind of how those two things fit together, which people probably won't agree on. But at what we we did have we we did look a little deeper into the data this year, and uh, IoT and or edge was about sixty one percent total. So uh, so that's kind of the number. So that's kind of the number one category. And there are a number of barriers to the adoption of machine learning in the AIML space, and pretty much an even split between collaboration, uh, managing the tools and frameworks, and provisioning the infrastructure. And arguably, those two categories are, those last two categories are probably a little bit uh, mixed together. But, um, you know, there, there have definitely been some challenges, and you remember my earlier number about the funding for storage and data analytics, and 
those are probably some of your issues that you're seeing reflected there. Um, we didn't ask this this year because we frankly got some pretty interesting results last year um, and probably didn't have too much more say in it, but the, this is about legacy application migration strategy, basically. And the, what I think is interesting here is that there's no dominant answer. You know, you don't have the vast majority of people saying, hell, I'm just going to redo the whole thing in a great big green field, or saying that they're going to, you know, update or modernize, going to re-architect, going to just leave things as they are and pretend it isn't there and hope it doesn't break. And, or, you know, some actually say, well, this old mainframe app or this old, um, you know, proprietary Unix. App. No, we're, we're, it's time to turn that off and do things in a new uh, and better way. So th that's sort of my, I think, I think that provides a very nice, you know, there is no single strategy and the CIOs realize that. Um, this was a new, normally we, you know, I remember when I was talking about qualitative research. Normally we ask questions mostly the same from year to year because this lets us go, oh, you know, things are going up and to the right, things are going down and to the left, whatever, that really let us track things from year to year of, you know, has something changed this year? But, um, as I as kind of brainstorm with uh, my research partners, um, one of the things that I think often come, I, I sort of got to add a new, a new question this year, which is basically, you know, how likely are you to select the vendor who contributes to the open source community? Now, I'll come clean here, and that is that I think it's something, it's something at, say, Red Hat or IBM or companies that work, you know, in open source. Like, well, yeah, I mean, we're giving our customers value that way. You know, we have the world's expert in this technology working in the upstream, collaboratively in the upstream with other, uh, other industry partners. So this gives a lot of benefit to a customer. But I think our sort of, I mean, we must have asked something along these lines at some point, but I don't think we have recently. And, and quite frankly, so, you know, Kelly, this is probably not one of the results that we're going to want to publish, but, uh, but you know, let, let's ask it anyway. I mean, I'm just kind of curious what's going to come from here. And, um, and Kelly agreed and we asked it and uh, yeah. 83% are more likely to select a vendor who contributes to the open source community, which kind of made both of our jaws drop uh, when he saw it and our CEO very much like that as well. Um, so uh, one thing I'm now sorry, we're now sorry about is we didn't go into this in more detail at the time, because I, I'm very curious, I mean, I, I have some theories, but I'm kind of curious as to why that was such a striking number. Um, yeah, because I, I have to assume that most of those, uh, see, you know, the, the decision makers are not ask, answering that way because, oh, because that company is so nice, giving that m money and developers to those, uh, to, you know, to those open source projects. That's so nice of them. We ought to buy more from them. I don't actually think that is primarily the case. I think it. I, I and, you know, the theory that I like is that this shows that a lot of IT decision makers are really starting to understand the open source development model and how it benefits them. And, and you, know, you know, this absolutely obviously fits in with how all these companies are saying up open source program offices and the like too. And I find this a very encouraging, um, you know, kind of development that kind of gets beyond, you know, the somewhat tiresome is, is such and such a company, uh, 
giving enough back to the community. And I think this really demonstrates there's, there's a recognition of the benefits. And, you know, this is just a quote from Dr. Lisa Costa at, at the DOD, and really talking about how the partnership with the open source community is so important. And basically, we want to take advantage of that kind of partnership and that kind of collaboration. And that's why open source is important for us. And with that, that is, um, that is my slides. And we have a few minutes for questions if anybody is uh, interested or discussions or comments or, oh, Jeff, you can, you can, uh... <laughs> how did you focus this with the group of all the uh, various staffs that you had? I, uh, are you surveying customers? Are you surveying... Um, okay, yeah, I, I've going through a lot of them. So the question is basically the demographics for the survey. Um, so enterprise open source, the enterprise open source uh, survey that we do through uh, Quadrix, I believe is the name of the company. That is just an industry panel. Now, many of them are probably, well, I think it's a good bet that many of them are Red Hat customers, but it was not, specific. it's a third party, you know, it's a panel from a third party. Um, focus groups, it depends, um, oh, so that, that is enterprise open source. The Global Tech Outlook Report uh, we basically, a couple of years ago, folded a Red Hat customer survey and a, um, an industry tech outlook survey into, into one survey um, so that there is you know, it's sort of a broad industry panel and there is a Red Hat customer component. Usually, we don't see that big a difference, partly because you know, Red Hat customers are not that unusual, you know, representatives of enterprise customers these days. Um, but, but, and, but we can, we do have enough of both that we can do slices in the data. And there's usually a couple of things that, that will turn up there. One of the things um, from last year, and I think we got a similar result this year, was we asked some question in the vein of uh, how important is culture for your, I don't remember if it was digital transformation, but something like that efforts. And the Red Hat customer list was significantly higher than the general list there, which I don't, which I find interesting, although not necessarily completely uh, surprising. Uh, focus groups, it really depends upon the focus group because we do run focus groups um, that are that are they're looking at things from our customers, you know, what their perceptions are. Um, and you know, that might, that might be picked from a customer list. Other focus groups are um, either a broader panel or it's, or, it's a mix, or it's a mix of the two. I'm less involved in the focus group side, but, um, uh, but, but yeah. So, um, so it's, it's typically a mix of the two. I, I will mention that, you know, I'm kind of showing you some of the, the public data here. We do also use these surveys uh, for things like um, brand perceptions, uh, you know, between companies and like, which is always very interesting because there's always results in there that, you know, are like, no, that's not right. How can they say so and so is bigger in open source than we are, you know, and that kind of thing? And you, you see a lot of perception is a reality in those kind of questions. Um, any other? Oh, oh, you're putting your glasses up. I thought that was. Oh, I, will, I will ask a bit if you had any interesting insights about image storage. No, we have no. That's an interesting point. Uh, that's an interesting point. I will have to write that down in my little notebook. But no, we have we. As far as I know, I. Uh, uh, we like I like. 
I don't, yeah, as far as I know, we have not asked questions around OSPOs or inner sourcing or that kind of thing. And that would be, that would be something interesting to do. Yeah. Yep. Um, open source practices. Do you recommend to companies that they sell OSPOs or things of that nature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, Deb's, Deb Bryan's people are probably better equipped to answer that than I have. Um, you know, I, 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 well, I, I do kind of personally ask questions and like, I, I think some of it is a maturity thing, you know, as. Uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I don't think the stock answer of, oh, you all do open source, start an OSPO, is necessarily the, is not, is not necessarily the right thing. I mean, the, obviously, the bigger the company, the more strategic, the open source, you know, as, as you've presented on, you know, there's also very different types of OSPOs, kind of depending upon what the goal is, you know, is this to, you know, so that we don't mess up our licensing and get in legal trouble, or is it because we really are want to you know, do all this innovative participation upstream communities? So, um, you know, I, I I think a law case for large enterprise, I think a law cases it makes sense, and you know, and as you've been saying, you know, you're you're seeing a lot more examples of that, um, but. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it's the type of thing that, in my experience, talking to smaller companies, I mean, you probably a reasonable way to get started out is, you know, have a, you know, sort of a uh, chief cook and bottle washer, you know, developer advocate slash uh, community manager slash uh, whoever in indoors, um, you know, inside, preferably with well, with the endorsement of uh, whatever the appropriate leadership is. Yes? Back on the topic of inner source. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you've ever gotten to any discussions where um, some, en some uh, enterprise company uh, is consuming open source in the traditional subscription. Yeah. Way. Well, I mean, I think we've, I'm not that familiar with all the details, but certainly Open Innovation Labs, uh, this is part of our consulting arm, and basically the idea, obviously, hasn't actually been residency over the last 18 months or so, but the idea, you know, is that you either, you know, either sort of dedicated in their office in a red space somewhere, and we have permanent locations in Boston and London where we'll bring a team, you know, we'll bring a team of our consulting people, we'll bring in the appropriate team from, uh, uh, from the company that wants to say develop a mobile app, for example, uh, and, you know, in a, you know, phones off, type of, you know, don't be, you know, really, you know, heads down in this stuff. Um, we'll work with them in that way. And I'm not sure if that's the, if it works as the official definition of open, inner source, but I think it's that kind of a thing. Yes. Uh, just as, uh, to answer the question, um, Guy Martin, when yeah. he was at uh, Autodesk, often talks about the fact that their first um, initiative was inner source because they had to um. Yeah. Inside the company. Yeah. And they wanted to do that first before they did cloud transformation and then yeah. open source and things like that. Yeah. No, th thank you. Yeah. 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 So basically, Guy, Guy Martin, who's with Oasis now. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, he was sort of chief open source or whatever at Autodesk for a while, quite a while, and he was very involved in many of their open source efforts. Well, good. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you for attending in these unusual times. But we managed to get
Yes.